Cats or dogs? Oh, cats and dogs. Come on. Coffee or tea? Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> Coffee come on. and tea. Why, why is it Mount, either or? Mountains or sea? Mountains or sea. Oh, come on, Paul. <laughs> You're giving me choices. <laughs> you have to it's make a few choices always, today. Come why on. do I have to? I'm, okay, not yet. Give not me yet. one that I, I, I This is more interesting because if you give me one where I actually can decide, that was it. That's okay, interesting. One, one simple one. Dry heat or tropical heat? Dry heat. Dry heat. There we okay. go. You got me there. Playing music or listening to music? Playing music. Um, classical or non classical? Classical. Oh, okay. Um, opera or instrumental music? Opera. Okay. When you listen to music, you, you rather listen on the headphones or through speakers? Uh, live. Ah, uh, live. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid question. Okay. <laughs> Playing the piano or playing the fiddle? In terms of playing, yes, uh, uh, depends. I like playing uh, jazz on the piano, I like playing folk fiddle. Um, the opera thing is, is more to do with the singing, so you said play, you know, playing, okay. singing, whatever. First day of a production, re first day of rehearsals or the premiere party? First day of rehearsals. Reviews, you read them or you ignore them? Yeah, read them. Okay. Do they affect you a lot? Um... Yeah, okay. they do. Okay. People's opinions are famous. Some eternal yeah. questions. Carmen or La Bohème? Ka uh, Carmen. And um, Figaro or Cosi Van Tutte? Cosi Van Tutte. Pavarotti or Domingo? Domingo. Bill Evans or Oscar Peterson? Bill Evans. Okay. Um, performing or teaching? Interesting. That's uh, one where uh, I, I think... I, the sequel, I'm afraid. Okay. I, I can't make my, my mind up. Um, if you have to do it, early bird or late night shift? Early bird or, or late night shift? A late night shift, really. Okay. Well, thanks for taking time this afternoon. <laughs> 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 Welcome yeah. to our first new episode and the first episode in English um, here, Decisions. Thank you very much. Uh, my guest today is Rob Milner. My name is Paul Siebes and I welcome you to join this session today. Um, before we really dive deep into this conversation, I would like to mention that this series is totally financed just by your donations and for everyone who has donated already, I'd like to thank you very much. If you want to consider doing it again today or later, please see the details down in the video descriptions. I'd like to add on top of this that 20% of all the donations for this video will be donated to a charity organization chosen by the guest. And that will be my last question today. And then we'll hear where the money from today's episode will go. Also, you can ask questions yourself to our guests um, in the video descriptions. You will also see uh, the platform onlinequestions.org with an event number. You can put it in there and then ask your questions. We will see them here on the screen and forward them to our guest. So maybe I should introduce you a little bit more. Um, we met 17, 18 years ago when I was living in London as well. And I must say, I think you were introduced to me as an opera tenor. That's what and I, was. Uh, I remember you were traveling a lot uh, for productions in the UK, in, 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 in Europe, in Asia. You would travel to the States and so on. But the, the, most of the times when I saw you performing, you were playing, playing the fiddle <laughs> in Irish folk music. And I was really stunned by how many different things uh, you were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you also asked me a lot of questions about piano playing uh, because you wanted to get deeper into that. And we talked about technical things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a few weeks later I met you and you, you told me, oh, I've just bought a guitar three days ago. And you were playing in two voices <laughs> and, and uh, lots of... Uh, lots of songs already. I was always stunned by, by how many different things you do. Um, how early was that your thing? Was it already a thing for you as a teenager to do so many different things? No. Um, I, I, st I started to play the piano very early. Um, my grandmother had a piano and I used to bang it and make up songs about the, the dog. Yeah. And, um, and, and then... Uh, My my family were not musical, so so none of them were musical, and none of them uh, were educated beyond sort of school, the age of fourteen or something like that. So, uh, but they but my but they all loved music. My grandmother particularly, 
um, and my father loved music, and they all they they all really wanted uh, to encourage me because they could see that I loved music even from like I was three banging the piano and singing away, you know, randomly. Um, so uh, my father knew a guy in um in, he used to play in a pub, and he used to play by ear mm -hmm. all the kind of local pub pub tunes and things. And uh, he got him to give me a few lessons, but because he couldn't read music, he taught he taught me just how to to play a few things, you know, a bit of Scott Joplin and stuff like that. So I did that, and uh, then my dad got a piano that was going to be thrown away. Um, so he saved it, and it was, it was about a minor third flat, I think. I, I worked, <laughs> um, and it was really it should have been destroyed, but it, it was. It, and he kept it outside in the yard under a, like a little shelter and I used to go out in my duffel coat and, and play this little, little piano which was rubbish and, um, and then somehow I got put into grade 4 ABRSM exam system, yeah. <laughs> and failed it because of course I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing at all um, but, uh, so by then you had never had a formal lesson? No, mm. and, nobody, uh, and nobody and I was playing in the pubs by the way, at that yeah. age. Uh, also, I was doing a bit of Bobby Crush. The, there was a famous guy on the telly who used to play The Entertainer. I used to do that, The Entertainer, by ear. And uh, so then uh, somebody in my family worked out that maybe they should take me to... Uh, my grandmother, in fact, took me to a, a lady that had got a, a diploma, you know, in, in piano. And uh, uh, she said, well, no-one's taught him anything about music, you know. Um, he needs proper lessons, and so... I decided to have some proper lessons. I got um, very lucky. A teacher at my local school, because of a poem I'd written, uh, suggested to my mother and father that I should try a scholarship at the local private, you know, a better, more academic school. And I got a scholarship, a music scholarship eventually. And then I started to get educated in music. So it was a very, very, very slow thing. In my teens, I heard the operatic tenor voice and I just thought, I want... To do that and it was a very specific thing and it's something that I was chasing for the next I don't know 15 years before I found really uh, exactly what I wanted there it's, it's a long answer to your question no but but it, so that really was more special than all the other musical experiences before when I heard that mm -hmm. when I heard that I mean I'd been enjoying music on the piano and all that but when I heard that sound that tenor sound I, I, I kind of knew that you're not born with that. You know, it's, nobody's born singing Ness and Dorma. Uh, that it's something that's obviously you learn to do. That it's, it's trained. You have to you're, obviously something, something, some trick to it, if you like. Was it the sound which caught you, or was it the 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 skill, the athletic the sound, side of it? The sound, the emotion created by the okay. sound of the human voice achieving that. Do you remember a specific performance, a specific piece or recording? I can. It was Ness and Dorma, I'm afraid. Okay. But it wasn't probably. <laughs> it, was it was a guy called Bruno Pre Prevedi, right? That, okay. okay. Just think, I mean, it was a random record that uh, appeared in the, in, the apart, in, in the flat above the shop, in my dad's shop. I don't know how I, I got hold of the record and I put it on and I heard that and I just thought, that's it. Okay, and so when did you s start thinking, oh, this is something I'd like to do something like like to learn well at the, i was 15 so ah because ah when i heard that record because i i, I say this because uh, i just learned a few days ago that you actually studied literature then first and you were kind of playing with the thought of of becoming a writer a poet you, you were writing yourself you ended up writing libretti for operas well, as well yes i have these two things going on so so you know the, the thing that had got me the education actually was a poem it wasn't me, it wasn't me playing scott joplin you know badly on the piano um i used to play in different keys uh, not the right key and everything because i was just trying to replicate yeah. it um but it, but it was a poem that and you know the, my, my teacher didn't think I, it was me that had written it you know she said you copied that who did you go I was, no. so she checked with my parents and because i'd written that so it was sort of writing that had got me on so there was always that going on and I, you know read like crazy i love literature i'm passionate about poetry you know it's it's the most it's more important than music poetry to me it's more important than music wow okay um but but as a kind of 
a thing that sustains me in life. Do you know what I mean? That keeps me mentally uh, pushing on. Uh, the wonderful poets. I went to a college uh, in Cambridge where we, we had Byron and Tennyson at that college, for example. You know, I mean, it, this was this is amazing uh, to to be a part of that and to and and to enjoy literature and to and to, and to feel the power of literature. So that's always been there in my life, and it always will be. Um, but there's music as well. And music's not so far away from literature because, of course, you know, you've got all, all, all opera, this is a setting of words, and, you know, German lead, setting of words, isn't it? If I had gone to school with you at the age, let's say, 14, 15, that age, yeah. what kind of boy would I have met? Oh, somebody who loved football, okay. who's sort of playing with, with the lads in football and, uh, uh, you know, trying his best to do his studies, you know, times Were you already con uh, conscientious about... You know, music education, where you're getting more serious about learning music, maybe practicing the piano and listening to to recordings. Yeah, I think I think piano became a bit of an escapism for me. For me, you know, just uh, I had this little room with the piano. Eventually, my grandmother bought me a beautiful Broadwood, which mm -hmm. which was a, a lovely piano, um, but heavy. Uh, you know, you'd know that what I'm talking about in terms of the the, the touch of the uh, action was a bit heavy. Uh, for my fingers, I remember, but um, uh, it was a beautiful piano, it made a lovely sound, and I, I would just sit for hours and hours and hours. I would go, I'd get as, whenever I could find any music, I'd, because in those days, you know, you can't just Google and uh, you've got everything you need. Uh, you, you know, I'd go to the library and there's a music section like that, you know, <laughs> that's the music library in, in my hometown, and there was like some sonatas uh, by Beethoven and then there was a Dave Brubeck album and that was the thing so I got whatever I could and I learned what, so there, what, there was no separation between classical or jazz in the library really so music section and yeah, it was yeah. like that so I just got <laughs> random sort of things yeah, yeah. and so I, I had a rather eclectic and odd repertoire when I was in my teens for, for what was what I could get my hands on um, but, was uh, it more important for you to just get to know a lot of music and play through or would you also, also decide um, oh, I really want to properly learn this, bring it to my teacher, be able to perform it. Uh, yeah. How would you balance that? Yeah, but what do you see? Because eventually my grandmother got, uh, found me uh, a, a teacher, and my, and my mother and, and father um, found me a, a teacher locally that was, was a good piano teacher. And as you know, once you start the kind of lessons, there's a, there's a gradual sort of process of learning. And uh, in Britain, we, we use the mostly uh, the graded system of, of learning and, uh, and you learn musical theory at the same time and you gradually progress, you know, and, and, and I was, I couldn't get enough of it. You know, I did it very quickly and uh, I loved it. I loved all the theory. I loved, I loved everything, you know, about it. Um, You know what it's like. So you're the you're the pianist. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah. I had to. So you never. It was always holistic for you. So you you didn't go just intuitively. You wanted to learn the theory. You wanted to learn the. Yeah, I was never to forced to, to do. I, I think that I, that's something I, I really believe in. You know, you know, I was never forced by anybody to do anything like with the music. It was. It all came from a total desire and love. Uh, for music and would love to, to do it. Same with poetry and reading. Mm. Nobody said you must read your Shakespeare or you must. It was like wow. You know, this is amazing. But I was lucky. You know, I, you know, I lived in, in Birmingham in England. It's not such a bad place. It's, it's, it's got a bad press, you know, the black country and all that, uh, factories and all that, and, the, and, and the, the nasal accent, you know, because, because it's so polluted that it, uh, the nose is so congested. But in fact, they had, we had a young Simon Rattle building mm -hmm. up the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, to, you know, which is incredible. When, when I was young, go and see concerts there. Uh, we had Stratford just down the road where we had the Royal Shakespeare Company where we used to go on school trips to see a different Shakespeare play every month. Can you imagine that as an mm. inspiration as a child? Mm. It was like, you know, wow. Mm. You know, and it just makes life thing. so much fun and, 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 you know, it's a wonderful life, it's great. Uh, and there's all this poetry and music. And it's all around me. There was a guy who owned a pub in Budley just uh, in the next town to me who was, an in, what, he was the, the best stride jazz pianist or one of the best stride jazz pianists in the world Duncan Swift and he, and he used to Monday nights he'd, he'd got his grand piano he had a Broadwood and he'd do a concert every Monday of Fats Waller and all this General Morton stuff and he was, he, there was nobody better in the, you know he was fantastic and um, that was an inspiration and uh, we had uh, I saw uh, Buddy Rich twice at the Warwick Arts Centre this is what people people need inspiration I think to um, 
uh, to get going, you know, in, in the arts. And uh, if they don't get it, you know, it's not surprising that they don't feel it. Yeah. How did you make the decision then to study literature? Was it also, that is mainly my question, <laughs> uh, part uh, of the uh, practicalities? Well, um, I went off the rails. It's a bit of a bad story, this, right? Because I went off the rails. <laughs> um, I went off the rails at school because I, I got an early offer. to, to uh, It's called Oxbridge, we call it in England. And by the way, I'm just got to say thank you now for doing this interview in English, right? I mean, it's a sign of your great intellect and genius and a sign of my own it, total inadequacy. If we tried to do it in German, I would be doing shopping lists and, of, you know, <laughs> full tank and see bitter. I mean, the, the ability to express myself uh, uh, in German, I just don't have it. I, I know lots of words in German, of course. Uh, so, so thank you very much. So let me continue. Where were we? Um, How did you make the transition from being so obsessed with music as a, as a teenager, but then still let your passion for... Poetry, yeah, literature, and saying, win oh, for the... For yeah, the, for the, for the okay, so I went off the rails a bit. I got the, I got, I got the scholarship offered me early when I was young to Cambridge and uh, I thought, well, okay, that's it. And I went to the pub and, uh, I just, <laughs> you know, and, and just did that kind of thing for a bit. Just you became partied, a real poet. <laughs> partied and, you know, got the girlfriend. Girls came into the school at that at that age. They weren't in the school till then. So I started, you know, getting a girlfriend and, and doing all things that I shouldn't be doing. And um, uh, and uh, uh, and the teacher complained. And, of course, my academic studies went right down like this. And then the offer was taken away from me to read music at Cambridge. Huh? I see. So... I had a that's a is a decision making time this was you know? do I go do I stick two fingers up and say well you know I'm going to be me and have my life or do I sort of buck my ideas up and uh and try and uh get back you know so I did fortunately but I did it through literature and English and um and uh, with a with a choral scholarship you see so mm -hmm. the singer and I did work And, 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 and got on again, but uh, th that was a, a, a very important point in my life where I could have... So a decision which was forced upon you by some negligence before? Or yeah, uh, well, it was my own, own arrogance, stupidity, foolishness, young youth, all that sort of thing, uh, you know. From all what I know about you, I see a, a great openness, a great openness uh, to for experiences and for new skills, and for new things to learn about a huge curiosity so of course <laughs> these things are part of life too and you were curious and open to it and you oh that's a uh, nice way went, of looking at it not the way them. my masters at school thought about it <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're used too narrow-minded yeah yeah as a musician as an artist you also have to you know have some experiences to express don't you i mean i don't know what you think about this 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 sort of trend now to have all these little sort of geniuses standing there aged 11 playing I mean you, you I kind of feel I do feel for them a bit I just wonder you know what's what's next for them you know if, they, if they've achieved that already at 11 then then where are they going to go from there yeah you know uh, but maybe they also have a chance for these kind of experiences to catch up with so maybe they learn the the, the, the athletic skills early on And then they, they learn the life experiences and others maybe have to catch up with the, with the skills part and the athletics part and the technique part uh, later on. Yeah, I, I mean, don't know. It's, 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 it's all, it's all possible. It depends who you are, maybe at 25 or 30 years now. There seems to be this idea that somehow an 11-year-old playing a Paganini or something is, is, is kind of better than uh, somebody else doing it. But I, I disagree totally with that. I mean, I, I would much rather listen to old people playing music, right? I'd love, you know, those recordings of, um, uh, you know, Horowitz or, or uh, Rubinstein or all these people, Richter. These are the people I listen to. This is, the, this is what I prefer. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, uh, Nadia Boulanger, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, somebody like this Uh, but uh, this idea that I suppose it's just like a difference between a circus act and, and, and real art in a way, mm. isn't it? There's a novelty value to the fact that they're little kids or something mm. yeah, uh, that, that, that everybody likes. Um, or, 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 that, or that makes people think, well, it can't be that difficult or something. I don't know. <clears throat> the, yeah, it's, the, it's a bit like the circus. I think people just love going to the circus. Yes, it's a bit like a circus act. And, and, and also, you know, entertainment now is becoming a bit more like, you know, the, the Colosseum now. 
mm-hmm. you know, it's like the, the, the football stadium. The sport, sport seems to have taken over a bit from the arts. Mm-hmm. And because we're going back to the days of Coliseum, I mean, it wasn't that long ago where cage fighting, if you, if you remember, was an underground illegal sport. Huh? Now suddenly it's, 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 it's a recognised uh, thing. To, you can have two people, put them in a cage and they beat the hell out of each other. Everybody watches because they like to see the blood and maybe they might die and that might be even better because, you know, someone's, you know, we'd love to watch somebody die. It's back to the days of the gladiators. This is not, you know, this is, this is not evolution. This is, this is uh, going backwards in my view, my view, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Sorry to comment on that, all you lovers of that, that kind of thing, but but uh, it's uh, uh, the high arts are to do with the really um, more sophisticated uh, um, things uh, that uh, I recommend. Mm, so you prefer focusing on beauty rather rather than um, beauty aestheticizing uh, violence or whatever you could call it. Well, I mean, there's always there's a, the violence can be a part of uh, um, art. You know, I think of uh, Coriolanus, Shakespeare, or something like that. You know, but uh, it's a story in the end. But, but, but yeah, there's 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 a beginning and an end. There's some sort of catharsis. There's some sort of some sort of a comment on it. There's some sort of poetry to it. There's some sort of um, uh, artistic view. There's a view on it. It's not just there for end, pure, just you know, brutal sort of entertainment. You mm-hmm. know, I understand. Yeah. Going back to your studies, then, how much did you were you able to keep? Playing music while studying literature. How, since later on, you well, I mean, it was my came job. Opera. It was my job. I mean, I you know I don't know whether you know how the choral scholar thing works at Cambridge, but they have internationally famous choirs. Mm-hmm. Trinity being one of them. You know, I think <laughs> I think last time I looked, it was the fifth best choir in the world considered right by some you know thing on Google. Um, and you know, in, in order to keep keep the, these choirs good in Cambridge, they have to get good singers in. Uh, so, which 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 used to mean uh, that you didn't have to be that you know as academic maybe as uh, some other people that were getting into to courses um, because they needed your voice. Same with rowing; they liked good rowers because they wanted to win the bumps or the mm-hmm. win the Cambridge boat race and all this. Mm-hmm. I mean, so uh, that's why they sort of turned a bit of a blind eye to my um, bad year at school when I went off the rails uh, because I could still sing right. Mm-hmm. I, say, I had a good, good singing teacher at school, still a friend of mine, dear friend of mine, Tim Jones. He sings with the number one choir in the world, the 16, uh, Tim. And, uh, and he helped me immensely get a choral scholarship uh, to Trinity. But when you're at Trinity, it's, a, it's pretty much a full-time job. You're singing four, 14 times a week or something like that. Wow. You know, uh, it's, it, it, and you, you're doing all the college services and... Uh, And so you have no problem keeping your music going. It's doing. It's the, the problem is the other way round. Is how do you how do you keep the degree going yeah, yeah, when you when you commit? Because we toured America twice. We toured Germany, Kuschenbroich, wherever that is. I remember we we toured uh, um, uh, Italy. We toured. We, we, we did all these big international tours. We did five recordings, I think, CDs and stuff. Okay, so. Then you were already ready in, ready already thrown into the profession with with all the experiences well, of touring. Well, into the choral singing. Yeah. Now the cho- choral singing is a completely different way of singing. And sure, but, uh, but the, the mechanisms of touring, the mechanisms of, of recording, of you see this all being a musician. The, yeah, 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 being, yeah, these yeah, kind of things. Yeah, like, yeah, and, and being under pressure. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, like like you know, doing this live is an interesting thing to do. You know, it's it's fun. Uh, you can't edit. You can't, if you make a mistake, you just have to correct it on on on, on the hoof. You know. Uh, but you know, I remember the, doing live on Radio Three, one of these broadcasts f- services, and having a solo in it. You know, and and you know, you see the the, the red light go green, and then uh, the, the terror in you. You know, <laughs> it's just, and you've got to you've got to make a beautiful sound. You know, it's got to come out clear. It's got to be mm-hmm. the right note. Got to be in the right time. Got in the right place. Terrifying. Mm. But it's good. It does it. Good builds you, builds builds you up a bit. This whole stage fright aspect of the profession has it. How do you cope with it? Did it go better later on? Well, um, yeah. Well, this is a good, really good question because because I think and you, uh, you know the answer because because it's all to do with how um, how confident you are in in what you're doing. So, for example, I was winging it for a while after being a choral scholar, of course, and the technique is completely different to uh, uh, to bel uh, canto technique or whatever, where where everything is to do with the projection. You've got to make a, a, a big enough sound to carry above an orchestra. Well, if you sang like that in Trinity College Choir, you know, yeah, you, yeah. They, they would only hear you. 
um, and uh, uh, and you can't you can't do that. So um, so opera requires a completely different different uh, technique, and that was a difficult time realizing that. And how am I going to find that? And how am I going to develop my voice? And by being at Cambridge, I kind of missed a few years where I could have been at college developing my voice, like some of the other guys who had chosen that from the outset to do to do to do opera. So you're already a bit behind. And, uh, and the answer to your question is to, is, is to do with if you start doing stuff where you're not sure that you've got the right technique for it, then you are very, very nervous, right? But if, if you can then find that technique and, and be confident in your technique that you can get those notes easily, you know, and it's not a problem, then performance starts to become really, performing starts to become really enjoyable, and you can't wait to go on stage. You can't wait for the next performance. You're just thinking, oh, great, I'm going to go and sing Don Jose again, you know? And you just, you maybe we'll try something different tonight. Maybe we'll try, you know, and, and uh, uh, that, 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 but it's all to do with how confident you feel about yourself. So uh, I did go through a very difficult time where I, where I was getting roles, I was getting stuff, but I knew I wasn't good enough. And I was terrified to go on stage. Yeah. But you also mentioned the other day that sometimes it needs the situation of doing it in order to understand that you can do it. You have to sometimes, maybe yeah. you feel you're 90% ready and then you have to go to actually, you can fill up those 10% only by doing it. Exactly. And, and not only that, but with the really true, truly great composers for singing, they help you. The, the music itself helps you. And by doing it, it helps you, particularly Mozart. You know, particularly I found that with Mozart, that you'd, you'd look at the Mozart score and you go... <laughs> No chance, you know, I, I'm not singing. And then you get, you start to do it, and then, but you, 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 you find yourself singing it, and you come off stage thinking, how, how did I manage to do that? Somehow, the, the, the great genius guy, Mozart, somehow knew so much about singing, he knew how to help you along the way, and, and, and sort of miracles happen, you know, uh, not just, you know, but on stage. And it's, wonder, it's wonderful business. Mm. Of course, not everybody likes it. It's not the most popular thing. But, you know, if you like it yourself, it, it means a lot. Mm. When at your in your Cambridge time did you decide? Okay, after this, I want to go to college, to music college, to really focus on, well, on classical well, solo education. I do feel one of my faults in life at an early age was I was I was too guided by other people, in the sense that because I needed that to get me up and educated, I was always relying on people to guide me. I was. You know, I'm very, very. I didn't really start making my own decisions until later on in life. But so I did have a singing teacher who said, "Well, you should go to music college." And okay, okay, I'll go to music college. But and were I, you doubting this, or did you you, you you mean that you maybe made that decision too late? Well, I, I kind of wanted it, and and he, but I was I put myself in his hands, and he cho kind of chose the college, chose and thing, and the, and the college was with the guild, and I had amazing experience at the guild hall, as I'm sure you did, and I I, I um. Um, but it wasn't. It wasn't kind of. Well, the thing is, the, the comedy thing started happening as well. <laughs> I was going to ask. You yeah, that. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, that, and that's ridiculous. And that sort of. <laughs> yeah, I just have amazing. to explain it for the audience. Uh, Rob ended up having his own show on BBC as a stand-up comedian together with a partner. Well, Can yeah, you please tell us the story. Act, really. yeah. yeah, double act. Yeah. yeah, the guy, guy who has gone on to become notorious. He wrote the Jerry Springer, the opera, and stuff. His name is Richard But Thomas. The origin of that was was that in the Cambridge time. Did you meet him at Cambridge? Of course, or, we, yeah. were, we were pals at Cambridge. We just uh, we just uh, roll about the floor laughing at each other. You know, we, just, I mean, we shared rooms at Cambridge, and we and then and then we we, we had this idea to put on, you know get put, do this little sort of review or whatever it's called. And we had great fun doing that. And then, then, we, then people offered us May Ball tickets if we'd perform at the May Ball. And we got, and we thought, oh, we can, we can get some money and get some tickets. And so we did it and it sort of spiralled. And then a BBC producer saw us and offered us, you know, it all went sort of suddenly, you know, I mean, it was great fun. We was it just, a monthly show, a weekly show? We did two series on Radio 4, six shows, half an hour each, two series on Radio 4. And then, and then um, we did uh, TV Uh, special or whatever you call it, it didn't get us serious because they were, well for whatever reason but there were there were there was a big overspend at the BBC the BBC were was in trouble then the producer that that took us on Harry Thompson wonderful producer of comedy at the BBC he's tragically got cancer and died age mm. 45 and so we lost the producer we lost our way a bit it was a point where you know do we do we stop do we carry on We could be doing this until we're sort of 70 together, you know, and earning a bit of a crust 
or we could we could we could do other things. Uh, in the end, I suffered for a very bad uh, time of depression, and um, got through that fortunately. And then by the time I came out of that, I wanted to do more singing. Was it? I assume it was it because of the hype of that success. Or was it more privately related or a cause? That yeah, depression? there were lots of things going on and I'd rather not go into sure, too much sure. than that, apart from boring everybody's senses <laughs> on it. Um, But this, this comedy thing, I'm just curious, because of the, the big connection of Monty Python uh, to Cambridge as well, as far as I know, they were all there. Is, is that a big culture? Well, I mean, was it was that the, the, the soil for that. It was then because you know that so many uh, it was then so many comedians came out of Cambridge and Footlights and all that that there was this kind of linked to the BBC. But in fact, that changed a bit with with the the guys from Manchester, you know, all those kind of people. Um, uh, and I don't think it's it's quite like that now. Um, but there there was a bit of a, a corridor from you know Cambridge to, to the BBC for comedy. Um, and, to, and and of course, in the good old days of the BBC, they used to nurture people and take many, many years to nurture them. And so maybe by the, by the age of 60 or something, they might know what they're doing and, <laughs> and be funny. You know, but, uh, but that's, those times are gone. It's a shame because, because I think anybody British watching this would, would, would agree that they did produce some of the most wonderful comedy in, in the old days, sitcoms and things. So you, you spent three years in Cambridge? How long? Yeah. And then you went to the Guildhall? Mastered, yeah. Um, and while at Guildhall, you had your uh, show on, on BBC Four? Yeah, it was all happening around then. Yeah, just. Uh, How did you manage the time between well, no, the writing? The, the Guildhall was just before. And I remember the head of singing said to me, Robert, you've got to choose, right? You know, you either stay with us or you go off and go and do comedy or whatever. Now, that's all very well, but. You know, it was like 15,000 quid or something that the, the BBC were offering or something. That's a lot of money. I, I, was, I was putting myself through the guilt hall pretty much. I didn't have a lot of money. So, of course, I, took, I went for the money. In the, you know, of course I did. And she, and she sort of said, well, I'll see you on This Is Your Life or something. <laughs> One day. It was, you know, some, some bitchy remark when I, when I left. Uh, but I'm sure they understood, you know. Uh, and... Um, My, my singing teacher sort of said he'd met Laurel and Hardy in a lift once in New York. I remember him telling me that story. I'm sure he's telling me that story for reading, you know, when they were, when they were retired. They'd been together their whole lives, bless them, you know, and they're Laurel and Hardy. And I thought, well, I could be, with, I could be me and Richard in 50 years' time or something. <laughs> I so, think. But so you really, at that point when you made that decision, you had the vision, well, let's see how long it goes. It might be one year, it might be 10 years, it might be 50 years. Kind of was you were that open for this for for this uh, adventure? Yeah, it was it was it was perhaps uh, yeah it was a it was a difficult decision, but it was it was motivated purely by having to survive. You know, it was sometimes decisions are made just simply practical decisions, aren't they? You know, for money. So it, and okay, so we would rather call it an opportunity which came up rather than an aim you had followed. Yeah, with I determination. Mean, you, 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 you know, uh, training as a musician, as you know, if you're going to do it properly, it costs an awful lot of money. Yeah. Right? And additionally, if you've got somebody that's financing it, that's fine. Um, but uh, uh, I had a few loans here and there. And um, so I, I'm not the sort of person I want, want to take money off people. I just try and do it myself. So, uh, uh, yeah, money, money was a massive issue. After that show, after that comedy focus, so to speak, you went back to Guildhall, is that right? No. No. You, how did you go back to singing then? Yeah, well, I'd had, I'd had, I was quite sick with the depression. So it, it took me a year or so mm -hmm. to, to, out to, to recover. Um, and, uh, and then I auditioned uh, for a show in the West End. I was was wonderful company, Music Theatre London, wonderful innovative country uh, uh, company. That the um, director actually was, came to Germany. Eventually, he was offered a chair of opera studies at some university in in, in Germany, and, and has became quite a big director in Germany. A brilliant uh, a man, Nick Broadhurst and Tony Britton. They used to run this company, Music London, Music Theatre London. Brilliant, doing opera. In, in like a sort of musical, but in a very kind of real way. 
Um, and uh, in, in some ways, it started all that. I mean, some people don't. So you went into it. this production at the West End. So some musical, I, I was musical cast as Alfredo in La yeah. Traviata oh, in this wow. amazing production of it. You know, it was set during the sort of 1980s Coke AIDS kind of uh, generation. So she died in an NHS hospital bed of, of AIDS, and it was all done. It was beautifully done. It was it was a fantastic. I was. The production. This was this was the time where I didn't have the technique I needed. Do you know what I mean? When I was but you were offered the roles because, because you had the, the voice, you had the material, you had the skill, uh, and yeah. and I was the production carried me because it was such a brilliant production, mm. and uh, um, there you go, and so that's how I got back to that, and then I worked with them for several years, and I got got into Glyndebourne Opera, I worked with them, yeah. Yeah. How did you meet um, your teacher in Italy? Glyndebourne, really. I was at Glyndebourne. There was a tenor come over, Terrier Anderson, and a uh, lovely guy, Norwegian guy. And uh, he, uh, he he studied with Fr Franco Crelli and he got his number. And he said, yeah, he, he'll teach you if you he, if he get on. And, you know, he, I said, he teaches? He said, yeah, he teaches in Milan. He said, he said, here's your number, here's the number. So I go, I, I, I put, I'm, you know, I'm studying Italian frantically as far as I can speak to him in Italian and call him. I travel to Italy and I, I call him up, you know. You know. So just to explain for, the, for our audience, uh, Franco Corelli was one of the most famous tenors Uh, definitely in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. I mean, he was before name. the three tenors, so, so a lot of people don't know he, was, he wasn't doing a career as perfect, but he was the big guy before that yeah. concert that got everybody interested in mm. operatic tenors. Um, amazing uh, singer, a wonderful man. He had retired by that time, I guess? Yes, he did. The, he hadn't sung for 20 years. We're talking yeah. about late 90s, right? Uh, mm -hmm. of, yeah. yeah. And um, so you, you met him and you stayed in Milan for three years? Well, I asked if I could have a lesson with him. He said, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said, he said well, no. No audition. I said, oh, okay. Obviously, okay, he okay, wasn't committing. <laughs> and then the first audition, yeah, it was okay. He was humming. And next audition, eventually he said, okay, we work. And yeah, yeah. So then I used to, it was the day when Ryanair, you know, the days when Ryanair started with the five pound flights, which is unbelievable when you think about it. The five, five euro, five pound flights return and I used to get these five pound flights to Milan, stay a week or two, have some lessons and then go back, sing a See, chorus yeah. at Glyndebourne so I keep my voice going. It was good. Wonderful time. Best time of my life, really. Because finally I'd found what I was looking for, you know, and uh, the the thing that, um, uh, that that I really wanted to do, I was doing and hopefully after that I would be confident in my in my technique and my voice to be able to stand on stage and not feel like I'm, I'm a charlatan or an idiot. Mm. Yeah, I'm just curious about him as a teacher um, because I often find, at least with instrumentalists, the good performers and the good teachers are kind of different types of people. Uh, um, the way they explain, okay. sometimes very those who perform very well are more intuitively and they, de they tend to demonstrate more. How was it with him? Yes, um, uh, he he taught himself, uh, uh, and and was was taught by a few teachers, um, but uh, he, he he understood my uh, my quest, if you like, this quest for the for the for the how do you do it? How do they do it? How do you sing this stuff? And he he was friends initially with Laurie Volpe, and his wife uh, Loretta told me. That Larry Volpe never told him anything, <laughs> you know. So, Franco used to go to Larry Volpe. Larry Volpe, they'd, they'd have lovely dinners and they'd have a lovely <laughs> conversations, but he never told him how to do it, you know. And um, and then Martinelli, uh, another famous tenor, was more helpful. And and the teacher, um, and there was a, a teacher. He did get to a teacher. I can't remember the name of the teacher now. Maria de Monaco's teacher it was, and uh, that, that helped him an awful lot and he he then went and studied uh, the Garcia treatise at the Sorbonne and he really studied I mean he really studied he studied and taught himself and apparently you know from if you read the biography of Franco uh, I've got a copy of it uh, and uh, uh, he, you know he, his voice wasn't that good to, to you know it was it wasn't that impressive you know naturally but through sheer study and, and effort Uh, he he turned it into this monster of an instrument, this incredible, uh, incredible technique and wonderful power, and uh, and he, of course that made him a great teacher, 
because he he'd struggled. He 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 wasn't one of these guys that had had it all naturally, sang incredibly well, and uh, mm-hmm. he studied and studied and studied. So he made him a great teacher because he knew he he knew he said similar things to other teachers, but he knew how to make you do it, and he knew what you had to do physically and certain things, you know. Uh, and uh, so he did to actually, in my view, trans- transform uh, uh, my voice into... So it gave me the confidence, anyway, to be able to mm. sing, you know, Rodolfo and Don Jose and all this kind of stuff. So it's, for, for them, it's always about balancing the intuition with the intellectual kind of digestion of it, so you can really explain in words what you have to do, which then has to become your intuitive behavior again, intuitive pattern in a way well there, there's a problem there as well you, you, yes very good point uh, paul it, it, in that what what happens is that if you start intellectualizing the technique too much then that it slightly interferes with your instincts for performing if you like and that was a horrible moment when uh, i was i was i bumped into a director that was an assistant director in that company i told you about earlier the music theater company where um where uh, I'd been singing sort of naturally, kind of, in my opinion, incorrectly and badly, but the reviews liked it. It was kind of... Uh, because it sounded more like a music theatre. You know, it sounded mm-hmm. more like that. And, and the, you know, it worked to a certain extent. Um, but it wasn't proper, in my opinion. It wasn't properly good. Um, and, and I bumped into this... She was assistant director on that. And then I bumped into, she was actually directing Cavalleria Osticana, me doing Teridu. And, and she said to me, Rob, <laughs> after three years in Milan of striving to get this thing that and I'm standing there and I'm singing, thinking, right, this is, this is how I wanted to sing. This is, this is it. And, and, and she said to me, Rob, can you not sing it a bit more like you used to sing <laughs> before, you, you know, because she let And I thought, oh God, you know, you can't win. Don't perform, uh, uh, right? And, yeah, yeah. And it's like, actually, you, you can understand that the, the, the people, people when they're so used to listening to uh, recorded voices and amplified sound and all that kind of thing, it does sound a bit strange, an opera voice, to, to, to certain people, and they just don't like it. Mm. Um, many people don't like it. Even very, you know, very well-educated people don't like opera. They go, oh, oh, no. I'd rather, you know, Leonard Cohen, put the Leonard Cohen on or something. And you, you think know. the reason is that it's a bit artificial? It's an artificial way of using our voice? It's, it, Or like it, a trained? It, well, it's trained to, to project in a way that's not... You know, there's a big article about this in the, in the great book on the, called The Grand Tradition about opera. It's a big article in the... In the he says, look, look, things are changing, amplified sound has come in, the aesthetic... Uh, nature of singing is changing in terms of what people people like a natural pure sound a very small voice which can be ampli- amplified you know um, there's no there's no real need to, uh, to, to 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 have the power and so that maybe sound over might sound overblown or whatever like that but for me it's still it's still the most beautiful way of singing fullest way of singing the most artistic way of singing the uh, proper bel canto uh, singer I, i've had some wonderful singers in these last few years yeah mm. so you you really went into the into the singing you did a lot of productions as a soloist and the biggest kind of italian repertoire lead, you know, i was never really i never really reached the top to be fair to me i mean i i I, I I was working for the lower some sort of touring companies, you know what I mean. I was never like at the Staatsoper. I mean, I did some of these big places, um, uh, but not. I wasn't sustaining a career at a very high As level. A career, yes, but you sang the same repertoire. That's what I mean. You sang the same. You sang repertoire in the low, lower uh, touring companies. Lead roles in all the famous uh, Italian operas and Mozart operas yes, and I so did. on. So yes, it's, it's, I did. It's, it's, it's as a As a repertoire, you did the same kind of work. Maybe that's, it was that's less, right. you were less famous, or the company you were for less paid famous. <laughs> <laughs> Much for doing it sometimes. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Now I'm I'm curious because that was kind of the time I met you. I think in the early 2000s uh, that you, because you, I remember you were touring a lot. Uh, you were going to to Asia, even to Kenya with special productions. You were touring in the states, in the states, in in the UK. Um, but you were still. I mean, in all these years, I think we've covered now maybe six, seven years since your teens, uh, or maybe ten. Um, this this passion for folk music, for the fiddle, 
when did that come in or it never left maybe we could just because we haven't mentioned no, no, it, I mean, it's uh, exactly but, the same thing as the as the as the as the opera i uh, think you know you have to you don't know it unless you hear it do you mm-hmm. if you've, you've never encountered it something before you don't know it mm-hmm. but but if you encounter it and it's something that you absolutely love and are passionate about uh, then uh, that's what the, the, then you follow it up or you don't whatever. But well, that is the question. So I, it's a decision I to make to to actually. You say you're an, I'm an opera tenor. I need to you know learn my repertoire. Be careful with my voice. Where I go, where I spend my evenings, yeah. and all that. But then you make the decision to say, ah, oh, doesn't matter. I want to learn this. I want to spend time there. I want to play in bands. I want to learn all the yes. tunes. And um, but you know, and you would think that. Some of the, like Frank Corelli, as strict as he was as a teacher, you would think that he, you know, when I talk to him about the fiddle and all this, uh, that he, you would think that he would have said, um, no, you know, don't do anything, you know, just focus on it. He didn't at all. He said, oh, I hear you play the fiddle. He, oh, that's great. He said, you should, you know, because I think he understood that, you know, it's useful. You can, it's useful to have another, another string to your bow, you know. As, mm. as we say in English, mm. um, but but the, the, I know exactly, precisely when when I was inspired. First of all, the folk music was was in a pub in Edinburgh at the when I was at the Edinburgh Festival performing comedy, mm-hmm. and I I I heard a folk group playing uh, a little just in the corner, just uh, and I heard this most beautiful melody, and I didn't know what it was, you know. I, normally, I just a melody you think, oh, that's uh, you know Massane or something, or that's why. But so this amazed me, and I and I said, what's the name of that? And they said, oh, it's called the resting chair. I remember even the name of the, the piece. I said, it's the most beautiful melody. He said, oh yeah, there's hundreds of tunes like that in the folk tradition, and there are. I mean, there's um, thousands of tunes, in fact, beautiful tunes, melodies. And so that got me uh, got me uh, really interested in folk music. But then I was up fishing, because um, that's another passion of mine, uh, fishing, fly fishing, um, on the uh, Outer Hebrides. And, um, and I, there was a, a f- festival of, of Celtic music, and there was a little old boy comes in with his fiddle, and he starts out playing fiddle music. And I was like, magical, you know? And I thought, well, I want to do that as well, you know? So... <laughs> Why wouldn't you? You know, and I, I play a bit of. I had a few violin lessons. You don't know how rare you are because so many people have that. That uh, um, and I know it for myself. I would think oh, I would love to be able to do that, but then I would just stick to my guns. I would just, you know, I know I'm, I should focus on my piano. I should focus on on the things I have been doing and make them better. And yeah. you just dive in. You have this tunnel energy then for some time uh, yeah, until uh, uh, you get to the level you at, you at least want to reach. Yeah. Well, w- one of the good things about the singing side of it is, is that, as you said, you know, you have to rest your voice, you know. So there are times when actually you sing, you sing and then you have a couple of days rest. So there is time. You have okay. time mm. to do something else. It's not, it's, it's, uh, um, if, if you were the kind of person that was singing every day all the time and doing repertoire, you, you'd lose your voice, you know, you wouldn't, you mm. wouldn't, you wouldn't. So, so there is, so there is time. I had time, and uh, and I and I found ways of learning through books and and listening. That's the best way with folk music is to listen and and to and to always play with other people. To go and play and meet people and learn from them, and it's a, it's a wonderful scene. And it's not as bad as it used to be because the smoking ban now indoors most most places is is much better. Because when I was when I was interested in it, you'd come out kippered, you know, you'd just be, and that's not good for you to be in a mm. smoky environment. Mm. But I was, um, so there you are. So I was passionate about fiddle music. So I learned, just carried, uh, uh, to this day, I still love playing the fiddle and I love playing the fiddle in sessions, you know? Is it a different, or do you also like it, I'm just curious, because it's a completely different performance environment and a different pressure, a different, how can I say, approach to the event? Well, it's a completely different approach to music, actually. The, 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 um, The, the, the way, um, you know, it doesn't really matter. No one's talking about theory here. No one's talking about anything. It's just pure music. I, I describe it like this. Uh, you know, you've got the crystal stream of crystal pure water, and then you've got the deep ocean. And it's, they're both water, right? They're both mm-hmm. a thing. But I think the, the folks thing is the sort of crystal stream, and the deep ocean is the kind of classical symphony or something. Because a lot of composers, they use these tunes. I know Beethoven did, you know, Vorak did, you know, um, Bartok and, and Vaughan Williams and all these people, they, 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 they took these, these, these tunes and, they, and, they, they, and it goes to this deep ocean of, of some sort of amazing, mm. you know, 
Titanic. So. I, I understand that you, you don't mean it in any kind of judgmental way. No, because just, a beautiful different. crystal stream could be yeah, is yeah. the most beautiful thing mm. in the world. It's pure and uh, and and it's the pure. They call it the pure drop in Ireland. Is what they call the Irish mm -hmm. folk. It's right. It's the it's the purity and the simplicity, if you like, and is is part of the um, the the beauty of it. Um, How do you think has playing and diving into that tradition and and discipline, so to speak, impacted your classical side? Well, I think it's. Uh, I think you know. Uh, I always feel that whatever you do informs other stuff you do. It should sure. do. Even living, you know, anything you do should inform what you do, what you, what you feel you are, who you are, what you do. Can you? Would you say that consciously that? Oh, I think I've become a much better improviser. I can deal better with. Yeah, with just accepting any situation because of, of the way you make music in, in folk music tradition, um, you know, bringing that quality over into classical music world. Uh, okay, yeah, great question. And, 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 and that, that, that reminds me of a time when I, I realized uh, what, a, what a poor musician I was. When somebody came to an audition, I was, I was supposed to be helping in the audition, and they wanted to sing a song, you know, the famous song, Daisy, Daisy, da-da-da-da. And uh, they didn't have any music. And, and they, well, you can, go on, Robbie, you can play it, can't you? And, and actually, I couldn't. I, could, I, I couldn't sort of just harmonize it and play it. I, can't, I could now easily, because, but I can now because of the folk tradition, not because of my classical education in music. Mm. The theoretical thing is all very, very good, but the practical uh, thing about playing with others in, others in folk sessions makes you listen mm. and try and listen harmonically, listen, listen to this harmonic structure so that you can go tonic dominant, subdominant, tonic dominant. You know, you can you can follow the the harmony. And that, 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 I do think, has, yes, has made a huge difference in my musicianship. I wouldn't say it would, uh, in some ways, feed the opera. There was, a, there was a moment when I was on tour doing Bohem in Ireland where the music, the assistant music director said to me, Rob, you know, can't you just get on stage when you sing Bohem? You need to do it like you are in the pub playing the fiddle. You know, because in some ways there was a freedom about 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 playing the fiddle that I just mm. I take the fiddle, go on and, and, and just play wildly for hours, mm. uh, and I had a great passion for it. So and and he noticed that actually, if you you should do that with your singing though, actually, mm. you know the the, the 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 striving for perfectionism with the singing is actually inhibiting. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> That's the, that's the point I, I was trying to find out what you think there um, so would you also then say that with the type of career you had as a classical singer fed or supported by your career as a, as a in the end jazz as well later came pro I think you started more with, with no, folk no, and then I, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't say that no <laughs> <laughs> what wouldn't you say? I mean, I that, it, that it was fed, that, 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 that the, the one fed the other. I mean, apart from that, it fed me in terms of in actual food, in the, in the sense that <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> my but, own money. But what I meant is that this ability to be more flexible. I mean, as you just mentioned, it's, it's about the balance between the perfectionism or the, the, the kind of perfectionism you need to, to reach a certain level, which is the minimum to actually have a career. Absolutely. Um, and then maybe it goes into a toxic, at, at the last bit, maybe into a toxic range where it, it gets inhibited, inhibited yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, where it actually maybe wouldn't become any better. And the pressure is also getting so high that maybe the life doesn't become any better. Maybe you earn more money, maybe you've got more famous and prestigious companies to sing for, but maybe the life wouldn't get any better. And so the question is... Um, was did you consciously at one point did you did you get aware of this this advantage? Um, I, well, because I consider it I consider it an advantage in a way. You consider it as well, which I, I think I think the the it was useful to be able to keep going. You know that's mm. the thing. I had something else. You know if you, if you if you've got a, a a few a few months contract, but then you haven't got anything for a few months. You know, and you can't you can't go you go to a job uh, uh, you can't get a job. Because you can't then ask them for three months off because you've got another contract or whatever. You've got to find some ways of, of keeping yourself going. And I know, I know, 
people uh, do, uh, that, that were singers, very, very good, very fine singers, that had to get jobs doing other things. It's very difficult uh, uh, to sustain community arts. I mean, it, it was Richard Bryce, I think, that said the artists themselves are the biggest sponsors of the arts, in a way. We're the biggest sponsors because because we give so much and and, uh, and don't don't get much in return. Um, so uh, it enabled it was an enabling thing and kept me going a bit longer. In the end, after the financial crash of two thousand nine or whatever, I and I and I I started to think, you know, I I need a proper job. You know, you know, I've had a proper job since uh, two thousand ten. And we get holiday pay. You know, that's the thing. You know, you, you, I'm, on, I'm on holiday <laughs> now and I'm getting paid. Uh, that's incredible. I'm not, you know, we're not yeah. having to go and sing an aria or do this or anything like that. I'm, I'm just having fun talking to you, whatever, and I'm getting paid. And that's the, the beauty of having a proper job. Mm. So the, the, was it that direct that after 2008, 2009, you felt that this job situation was different? Oh, well, or was I mean, it just the sponsorship for your personal timing in life? The sponsorship uh, ran out for some of the companies that I was working with, for starters. Yeah. But also, um, I, was work I was beginning to get a bit of work for the, with, with the bigger companies, and they were looking at me a bit. And, um, but even that, you know, it was surprisingly low paid. You know, I think people would be kind of shocked to, to, to hear what, what some really good singers get paid for, for doing what they do. Um, because, you know, let's face it, you know, it needs a huge amount of funding, the arts, it, it, the, the high arts, it does, of course. if you're going to do it properly. And, um, and if, if you take it all, so the very famous singers, they probably are a little bit overpaid, uh, right. but these are just five singers, probably in each voice. That's right. Uh, if at all. Same with conductings and uh, stuff like that. They, they, they get the big money and and uh, it's, it's a difficult business. Everybody knows it's a difficult business. And, you, you know, you keep on going. You could keep... I could have kept on going. I could still be doing it, but I wouldn't have a house paid off in Ireland. I wouldn't have savings in the bank, probably. And, and I just wanted to... Um, to I think I, I achieved something and I was very happy uh, to have achieved that and I, I didn't go into teaching because I had a passion for teaching that, that, so this is different so it's not like me seeing Billy Kennedy playing the fiddle and going oh I want to do that for teaching it was like oh you know I'll You know, so until that point, just to explain again, until that point you haven't really taught? Yeah, I mean, you had many well, students and so on, but yeah. you had never had a teaching position anyway. No, I had a friend who, who tried teaching for one day and he got punched in the face <laughs> and kicked in the balls and he, and he broke his glasses, right? In the first day and then he left. And, and so my <laughs> most people are saying, don't teach, you know, whatever you, you know, it's a nightmare. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and, and I don't think you'd be school. any good, Rob. You'd be useless. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't be any good as a teacher. You know, you you you, you would just you're too big a character, whatever. You know, yeah, yeah. and and so it was a huge shock to me uh, when I did start teaching. That I absolutely loved it because I, I know you went, you had your teaching career in the Middle East so far mainly. Um, was that also this this change of culture and of living environment which attracted you? Yeah, definitely. So, no, I mean, I have to admit, yeah. I do, I do love the Middle East. I love uh, the whole influence of Islam, the Middle East, uh, the people there, and uh, and it feels meaningful. You know, it, yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you miss the previous performance life? Well, I did a lot of it. I've, I've never. I mean, you know, I was I was almost more busy as a performer, funnily enough, yeah. once I started teaching than than I was when, when I was doing it. You know, I mean, I was because I, the competition out there because there was the I was the tenor. You know, if so, if so, Mozart Requiem, I did it. I did two Mozart Requiems, two Haydn Creations, Messiah, Madame Butterfly, Don Giovanni. I did. This is since starting so yeah, teaching. Didn't, didn't stop performing. Yeah. I didn't stop performing. I did recital de Saliba. I did. Uh, I did. Uh, I did uh, three opera galas. I did three tenor concerts. I did. Bloody bloody blah. blah, blah. Yeah. I, I formed a jazz band. We did. We played twice a week. Uh, a folk group. We played once a week. So I've been all almost together more now. performing yeah. since <laughs> getting a proper job. It's like a, a comment by a friend of mine in a band. I used to play in a folk band. Comment that made me go to to to, to, to take teaching as, uh, as a career uh, was was that uh, you know it was only since I got I started teaching I started getting a, got a proper job that I realized how much spare time I got. Hmm. Because you make the most of your spare time, that's the thing. You know, mm -hmm. you finish, it's a bit like, you know, you remember at school, you finish school and you think, oh, great, I'm free. 
and then you then so then you sort of you practice and or you you do something you mm. fill the time mm. so it's it, it, it's it's structure so i do recommend uh, uh f- full-time employment as a <laughs> as a thing <laughs> for happiness for the teaching how do you see yourself as a teacher do you do you try to do things i mean how conscious are you of the teachers you had at that <laughs> age Do you try to, you know, always try to be the better teacher or the better parent or the better whatever than we had in our, our you know, uh, younger years? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's be honest. I was a terrible teacher when I started. I, I, uh, I, I was terrible because there were certain things that came natural to me that I did, therefore didn't know how to teach because I never had to learn them. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So when you get somebody that can't do something that you never had a problem with. For example? Well, say say breathing, but sing, for example, you know how to breathe the singing. I didn't know any of the theory of it. Nobody had had probably had to teach me. In fact, Frank, I remember Frank was saying to me, "I'm not do- dealing with the breath because it's fine, right?" So, no, I'd never studied it in that sense. I didn't know what I was doing really. Somebody comes with a problem with breath. I had no idea how to fix it or how to teach them. So I had to then start working at understanding, going back and and and, and thinking about technique. And all those aspects of technique that maybe I, I, I found easy that, that, that I had to sort of relearn and rethink to become a better teacher. But no, I was also fortunate to, to get regular papers that sent to me from uh, Cambridge where updates on, on educational research and things like that. And there was some absolutely incredible uh, um, information that, that, that proved to be crucial to, to, to teaching Uh, and or, or the one is the um, the um, importance of uh, uh, serotonin levels in the brain um, that massively improves cognitive function, particularly in the area of memory. And and of course, when you think about it in your own for your own from your own experience, you think, well, that's absolutely right. You know, as soon as I had a teacher that that believed in me, that was being kind to me, that was encouraging, that was giving me good marks, I became happy and I started to uh, excel at what I what I did. Mm. No coincidence. <laughs> no coincidence. Yeah, yeah, of course. The worst thing you can do for anybody is to put them off, is to, is to be uh, disparaging to them and make them feel uh, bad. Mm. And uh, uh, if, you, if they start to become happy, in, 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 then everything improves. Everything improves. And it's a miracle. It can be a miracle sometimes. Uh, that plus the other paper was uh, why do teenage girls scream at rock concerts? Very interesting. <laughs> Right? Explain to us, yeah. Yes, you uh, have a guess. You know, I mean, the answer was uh, that the frontal cortex development uh, doesn't happen until the early 20s, and the frontal cortex of the brain is the control seat of the emotions. And so literally they can't control their emotions, see? So teenagers cannot control their emotions. So they, be, they scream and cry. And when you think about it, when you think about the love affairs you had in your teens and you felt so emotional and, oh, she's chucked me and I'm going to... I feel so despairing and, oh... Yeah, it's because your frontal cortex, it's just that. It's not something romantic or anything spiritual. <laughs> it's just your brain hasn't developed enough to be able to cope with, with this it kind of thing. It's so dismissive of it. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be yeah. dismissive. No, no. I wouldn't be dismissive of people's pain and suffering or whatever that they're feeling emotionally. But, but to understand no, yeah. that, that, that that's not their fault, you know, they're not some being some sort of idiot. No, no, in a way, just to sidetrack a little bit, it's, it sounds a bit as if it was a mistake of biology. But I guess it isn't. I'm sure there's a reason which we have for, I have to understand a bit, so grasp a bit better, why we have that well, it's one lack of control or ability for enthusiasm. Uh, you could call it also, you know, more positive. Uh, yeah, and well, why do we lose it? That's the... <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> see, maybe that's you the could thing. almost... I see exactly. where you're going. I see where you're going. Not everything. And why can't we get back to that to sort of lovely kind of time where, where we I just... I mean, artists have the reputation of being less controlled and have more enthusiasm, more openness, more passion and uh, maybe blindness for rational doubts uh, for all these things whether it's true or not but it's it's the reputation art has somehow yeah. to be more emotional and be more have more of that romantic or romantic romanticizing yeah. approach yeah i mean, I, mean it, 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 the thing that fascinates me about say uh, music music and emotion is is when is when you feel is what makes you feel something but you know when there's a when there's a phrase in a piece and it, it, it's usually the same phrase for everyone you know it's the same bit that gets everyone what is it about that music or that 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 composition and why does it make us feel like that that's something that's very difficult to explain mm. isn't it do you th- yeah 
I guess if for different types of music it's different. I was just asking myself whether it's, is it the melody? Is it the, um, the harmonic progression? Is it the interaction of both? I mean, some people are more touched by complex music. Some people are more touched by, by just the, 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 the melody, a certain interval, a certain yeah. sound quality. Um, it's it's difficult to say. So, I guess. That's right. That's why it's it's so important uh, for artists to strive for perfection and try to be uh, as good as they possibly can because the, the, a beautiful sound on a violin or a beautiful sound, a vocal sound, can in itself, just on its own, uh, invoke some sort of incredible feeling. It can make make you feel something deep. Mm. Um, and if it's just glibly sort of mm. played. It won't have the have the same uh, same mm. effect. Mm. Yeah, I, I've recently uh, heard this quote. I tried to get it right. Um, music makes you feel. Um, words make you understand or understand thoughts, but songs make you feel thoughts. Uh, I, I guess they're better. The wording was a bit better, but um, would you say that? with your passion for poetry especially, that actually the combination of text and music is, is there any hierarchy for you, is, is the best? Well, you get, you, get, you, get various, you get composers that are very sensitive to, to the words, right? Um, and we take, say, uh, for example, Benjamin Britten, you know, he, he, but he has a sort of intellectual approach to it as well, you know, so that there'll, be, there'll be little almost jokes within the music that you can see what he's talking about. Um, Thomas Hardy's, his settings of Thomas Hardy and, and, um, and the choir master Beryl and the hymn that, that, that's talked about in the, in the, in the, in the, in the song is, is, is actually quietly going on underneath the actual hymn. Mm -hmm. And, and the, you know, the obvious uh, uh, program music of, of, you know, the, the, the people and the music of the but four seasons everybody knows the four seasons where mm. they're running you know the, but um uh at the, but the, you know, there's not words i suppose there but, but, but do you, just more general do, do you feel that music touches you differently whether it's just instrumental music or voice maybe just vocalese or the combination of text and poetry and voice and music yeah um uh, i think uh, uh The, the combination of poetry and music for me is probably going to do it more than well now you know think of think of the Bach Chacon for example right and uh, D minor that's a moving piece of music that's as moving as any any anything set to any words set to music so I think I think yeah, and Bruckner symphonies for example m move me to the point of I'm almost having a breakdown you know And, and uh, uh, I think that, um, that, that, that they don't have any text. Um, Rachmaninoff apparently used to compose by, by studying a poem and taking the rhythm from a poem and then just getting rid of the words and just playing mm -hmm. music. I do, yeah, I don't think you need. I don't think you need the words, but but but, but I do love the, the a very intelligent and beautiful setting of um, you know Ivor Gurney's Sleep. Mm -hmm. setting of John Fletcher it's incredible it's an inc I mean you know I don't think it's a, a surpassable as, as a song I don't think anybody could write a setting of uh, of, of those words and, and come up with a better I song I think it was, it was a bit of a uh, maybe stupid question in the end all of these forms obviously have their their um, uh, value and and certain texts come out even better with the music other texts probably are other poetry maybe is better enjoyed alone And uh, yes. it's so good that we have instrumental music without words too. Yes, because poetry itself is music in a sense. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a rhythm to it and great. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Um, coming a little, back, a little bit back to your teaching, um, how did that passion pro progress? From you said you, you, did, you didn't start expecting the best of it in a way <laughs> you can say that again <laughs> uh, was there a certain turning point was it an internal decision or a mindset adjustment What i just started to, to feel the impact you can have on people's lives you know and 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 uh, i found I, i found it amazing you know when 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 you when you could you could turn people around like you know that literally make them feel happier 
about themselves and make give them the passion that you felt you know all that kind of thing that they say about teaching it's true you know yeah. you can and taken from your words i guess you're trying to be always encouraging and rather positive and not the i just have a rule school. i have a rule that i i have to try to love every student mm -hmm. i have to try to love them i have to genuinely feel love for them you know mm -hmm. what i mean because because and that's not easy mm. you get somebody come in and you don't really like them because suddenly you don't like everybody you meet they come in and you think oh what am i going to do here you know and it might take a year might take 18 i might take whatever whatever but you can find something and then then because they they know everybody knows the, the, the human ability to be instinctive you know to 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 have an instinct about whether somebody likes you or not or how the, the vibe you're feeling in any kind of interaction you kind of know if somebody likes you or they don't like you or you can feel it and any anybody has that i think and it's very important therefore if for a student To, to really feel as if you care about them, mm. and, and and as soon as they start to feel that, and they and and, and it's genuine, things can start to happen. Mm. But if nobody cares, no, nothing happens. And regarding the balance between perfectionism and versatility, how, how do you communicate that to, to the students? I mean, how much do you encourage them to get distracted in well, quotes? Uh, I uh, think yeah, well, it's it's good that you you call it distraction, and in a way, it, it well, is. It depends on what it is, really. Yeah, if you can. Uh, It's and, a balanced thing. And I do recommend people to be single-minded, really, and, and aim for perfection. That, that is really the best thing. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's an either-or. That's the, that's the main point about this, this discussion um, of uh, versatility and, 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 and perfection, perfectionism. I, I don't think it's an either-or. I think, no, for example, uh, Sifan Hissan yesterday in the, in the Olympics, did you see her? Did no. you see? Well, yeah. this is I love this this woman. She she she's an incredible long distance runner. She's going for three gold medals: five thousand, one thousand five hundred, ten thousand meters. Right, incredible. And um, she had a a round of her one thousand five hundred meters, um, and it, she didn't have to win. She had to come in the first six, and so she's just jogging away at the back, you know. And and but just before the final lap, where they started to get faster. The girl in front of her fell down, and she she fell over, uh, and and then lost another 20 meters. But there's a picture of her on the ground, and she's she's laughing, she's smiling at it, because she knows that she's just going to get up, and she gets up and she runs, and, and and actually wins the race, right? Incredible, yeah. Incredible, and and then a few hours later, it was the final of the 5,000 meters, so she had to then run the 5,000 meters, which she won easily. So she got the gold in that. So she's got two more finals coming. I hope she gets the three. But what I'm saying is, is the perfectionism of her is, is she's also ver versatile in the in the sense she runs the different distances. It's part of the perfectionism is is the versatility in a way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because she, she it feeds it. As long as it doesn't distract you completely from as having as the focus. I guess it's all yeah. about it's what about Well, it's beautiful, beautiful final word about this question. Uh, I'd love to go to the audience questions. Ah, please. Um, if there are, if I hope audience, we I'll have... Um, bored, bored the life out of them, so um, One second. I have to re-log in here again. When will be the next concert live stream? That's the question we have here. I'm not even sure. Have you done live streams online? Do you? Do are you in favor of that at all? <laughs> no, streams. I put I put stuff on. You know, uh, uh, yeah, certain performances I've I've got. I don't do uh, YouTube, or Spotify, and stuff like that. Partly because I'm slightly suspicious of them. Not not. You know, I don't put my stuff on things like that because mm -hmm. I I've got I've got another I've got another album coming out. Um, in March, look out for that with with a pop singer called Brina Carrigan from uh, the beautiful South. So that'll be out there. And uh, but as for this live streaming thing, it's a good idea. I mean, in the end of the day, music is speaks more than uh, than us just dri dri dribbling on, dribbling on about things. Mm. You know. Just... But I hear not much enthusiasm for online online performances. Is well i don't like it i don't, I don't mm. i'd rather be you know be i guess you have you must live. have done some online teaching during the last oh, uh, no years. I, do, i try to do that and there's a there's a second delay thing and i, I just was driving me mad i just thought I, if this is the way it's going to go and not for me I'll, i'll go i'd maybe train to be a plumber or something 
words. You know, okay, I'm, then I'm, I'm out if it's going to go. Okay, if okay. it's going to be that, I, I think you can't beat the live live performing thing. What are your plans for the future? I mean, do you plan to stay on? In uh, You're living in Oman right now. Well, I have a great job. I love the job. Um, and uh, I'll stay for as long as they'll have me. And um, it may change there. Situation changes all the time in the Middle East. And you never know. It's always a bit unstable. Mm. But um, I love what I'm doing. I'm, you know, just see what comes next. Mm -hmm. We have another question here. A conductor once, I hope I read it correctly, a conductor once told me I was too well brought up to be a professional opera singer. <laughs> Do you agree? Is there such, such a thing to be too well brought up to... Well, first of all, you either, you, you, either, you either see it as an insult to the opera singing profession <laughs> or as an insult to, <laughs> to, to you as, 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 as being too well brought up. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I think I think there's th th there's this, a, a great myth that there's some kind of a, a class. Um, well, first of all, it suggests that opera singing is a kind of almost like a sort of a, a working thing, like a like, you know, working man's job where it's physical and you've got to be. And that, there's a tr there's a truth to that for sure. Mm. It's not the most intellectual of pursuits, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all about sort of phlegm, you know, tongue, jaw. Whacking it out like a, like like that, being like being a shot putter or something, you know. Yeah, I think Olympic. people would be shocked how how an opera singer sounds on stage. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, they're, 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 like a meter and a half away no, they, a from what it does in the in the in the hall. <laughs> a, a director who who got into to opera from uh, from um, from theatre said he he just he said he could he just couldn't believe how loud loud the singing was, you know. Yeah. It, it's just, <laughs> but um, so so uh, to, uh, it's a good. It, 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 what I would uh, say about that question was, it was what an awful thing for anybody to put anybody off, you know, by saying anything to put them off. Nobody should be like that. So if you love opera, you, you want to be an opera singer, that should only be encouraged and it should only be, uh, and, and people should be helped to follow their dreams, follow their desires mm. and, and, you know, and, and stuff. And so to be negative, it's not yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it certainly should be a classless form of art despite well, it needing the money it, but uh, it, it is it, it, it's been adopted where it comes from and you look at it where it comes from the historically but there are all sorts of reasons for you know for, you know if you're going to put on a, a, a huge work that requires so much you know you need money you need but you know the, the the reasons why it's connected to, to to rich people is because you know how else are you going to put it on um, but but the values in 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 the operas, the the, the thing you know, the thing Mozart. I mean, Mozart was, was so worldly and wonderful in in all his beautiful ideas about the you know, he 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 wasn't some sort of an elitist person or some sort of mm. was he or mm. racist or any any of these horrible things. Let me see whether there is another question. There is still time for you to uh, ask your questions. Okay, I definitely have one last question, and that is where the part of the donations should go to. What is the charity or the organization you have in mind to support with this interview? Yes, well, I thought about this because if you remember when we met 20 years ago, uh, you introduced me to a young African guy called Njibulu. Mm -hmm. You remember him? Yes, Njibulu Madlala. Uh, uh, Madlala. And, and, and he's recently started this charity, Voices of South Africa. Yes. So wouldn't it be absolutely the right thing, as you'd introduced me to him all those years ago, for us to give a little donation? That's wonderful. I must it's actually, I can boring. actually say, the first workshop he did in Durban, South Africa, yeah. I went with him to wow. play play for the singers and to, to coach and teach with him. Yeah. That because was an amazing experience. Yeah. The, the, the stuff I've seen on YouTube and on stuff he sent me has just been incredible. The, 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 these, these guys from the township, they just love opera. They love singing opera and it's fantastic. It could be the future for me. I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see all these African voices coming out of Africa because mm. they love singing. Good. Well, Rob, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, dear audience, wherever you're looking and watching, uh, thanks for joining us today. Please do consider donating to support this wonderful organization as well. The details will be in the video description. We will also add again the details of this foundation. Um, if you want to follow more of this Decisions interview series, you can also subscribe to the Decisions channel on YouTube. I don't know where you were watching right now. 
uh, since this was streamed on various platforms. But in any case, thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Paul.